It's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Eve Lussier. Eve is Associate Vice President for Health Sciences and Chief Knowledge Officer for University of Arizona Health Science. He's Executive Director of the Center for Biomedical Informatics and Biostatistics, Associate Director of Bio5 Informatics for the UA Bio5 Institute, and Chief Knowledge Officer of the Lucier Group. Dr. Lucier is a professional engineer and physician scientist, an international expert in translational bioinformatics, and a pioneer in research informatics techniques, including system biology, data representation through ontologies, and high throughput methods in personalized medicine. His research is repeatedly featured in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. He was inducted Fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics in 2005, and in 2013, he, among, he was among 10 scientists invited by the Obama administration to the White House in recognition of their contribution to precision medicine. He has kindly offered to share his expertise with us today to better familiarize us with computational biology and data science strategies to promote advances in human health, especially in the context of personalized medicine. We look forward to his insights and advice. Welcome, Eve. Thank you. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, present in this uh, webinar. Um, and um, I've uh, provided a presentation that's an hour long, and you can probably get access to the slides to see the remainder, but we'll only do the first uh, third, the first 20 minutes of the presentation. Um, Very good. Um, a few disclosure. Um, I've had many trainees in different institutions, uh, been on boards of for-profit organizations and nonprofits. The only active one right now is uh, uh, GenPAC. And uh, in terms of preview of take-home points, um, I've been asked to present on um, how to bring precision medicine to the market and through Bob Frantic's methods, what would be the steps to um, take the uh, newest uh, discoveries and bring them to, um, to intellectual properties and as well as um, usable in clinics. Uh, the plan will be to briefly um, discuss of the precision medicine initiative, which is a bipartisan initiative in US. Um, the, some recent developments from our research group, I'll only be addressing uh, how to understand dynamic personal transcriptome and the interpretation through genome by environment single subject studies. And I, I hope this will be interesting for you because uh, it's been part of where we uh, provided new milestones, I think, for the community. And then a route to uh, our route to application. That's the second part of the presentation I won't have time to address, but if you have an interest in pharmacogenomics, uh, we're repositioning drugs using the non-coding genome, and not even the parts that are near the coding genomes, but really the entirety of the non-coding genomes through, uh, through genetic interactions of, and, and uh, interactions from non-coding genomes to the genetic regions. And this is, I guess, the uh, state of the art right now. Biochemistry is very advanced. In genetics, we can compare against um, personal genomes and know where uh, mutations or single nucleotide polymorphism reside. Um, however, for the transcriptome, a reference transcriptome, or for the proteome or the metabolome, reference proteomes or metabolomes are probably not best um, because they differ from tissue to tissue and from people to people. The normal of one person may be to have several pathways in balance homeostatically, but at twice or three times the expression of other pathways, of the same pathways in other individuals. Um, and therefore, the paradigm of uh, using a reference genome, which worked well for the genome, uh, doesn't really work. It breaks down if, if we look at the dynamics of the gene product. Um, one other aspect that we're challenging is really um, the single biomarker discovery. It really works perfectly for Mendelian diseases. In that case, a, a Mendelian trait can be recognized by that single mutation. And just like a crystal, it informs us of um, 
the molecular structure up to the, the clinical phenotype, just like a crystal we can see at the macroscopic level and understand the, the microscopic level. However, um, over 30,000 NIH grants have been funded in the last 25 years, more than $2.5 billion, and it's been relatively unproductive. For example, in the last five years, there's only 12 new biomarkers that were approved, and it has a limited success. And by first principle, we could look at it, um, you know, at the genetic level, biomarkers would be limited to maybe 25,000 genes and protein coding genes. Well, we know at least 60,000 diseases. So just by first principle, we know there's a disconnect of a one-to-one -one relationship. One could argue uh, at the proteome, we have 400,000 proteins, but it really, um, it really um, um, is different from the current uh, way in which we practice medicine, which is really a systems approach to medicine, organ systems. And the way systems biology has informed us on the complexity of the interactions. There's also other genetic evidence. If, if it were just a single gene biomarker that could explain diseases or response to therapy, um, you know, the complexity of the human being at 25,000 protein coding genes as compared to the warm, the C. elegans, at 23,000 code, protein coding genes doesn't make much sense. There's obviously a disconnect again to look at a one to one. But if we think of genetic interactions, the increase of two or 3,000 genes uh, has an enormous um, impact in terms of a uh, number of potential uh, combinations. We're speaking of trillion more combinations than you would get in a C. elegans. So there um, um, is another example that we probably should move beyond single gene biomarkers and consider um, systems level biomarkers, gene sets, and pathways will be used interchangeably during this presentation, but really we're speaking of genes that could be the target of a transcriptional factors, the target of a microRNA, um, all the genes involved in cell cycle, for example, are biological functions. And there's additional studies that also inform us that gene by environment is very important. In, in mice, the models, and that was very interesting because it was probably obvious to most, but now we have the genetic evidence. Different diets with exactly the same caloric intake, let's say the Japanese diet, the paleo diet, the American diet, the Mediterranean diet, with exactly the same caloric intake in a certain strain could get that strain obese with one diet, and actually if you slim down with the other diet, at the same level of uh, uh, calories. And then you switch its strain, and it's a different diet that does that effect. In other words, the genetic is very important. It, and, and these uh, mice were um, grown with the same microbiome. So it's really, at this, at this aspect, it's really a genetic, a genetic information of uh, how complex it is, and that it's not a single um, diet that will suit all human beings, since each strain, being really clonal or the equivalent of twins, correspond to the equivalent of a human being. So it just informs us that um, we all have to learn our own diet. But how do we interpret a personal genome if we have only one observation in each condition? And that becomes a problem at the transcriptome, the proteome, in the clinics, we often don't have uh, the, the, cost of, the, the cost is too, too high to repeat the measurement multiple times. And um, also the efficiency of care would, wouldn't be uh, adequate. Um, we'll pass on this. So the, um, coming back to the initiative of the American government, the Precision Medicine Initiative, the intent is to accrue a million pay people and to have their uh, genome and phenome and um, some adi additional few analytes and try to understand uh, how, how this complexity works. The participants, different from previous studies, are actually uh, not considered subject of the study, but participant, we're, we have some responsibility to provide back uh, to them with our, um, with our research. We were fortunate to be among the first four groups funded in US. Um, the, we now have eight groups, but um, the University of Arizona got funded in the first round, and we will recruit 150,000 subjects. Prior to this announcement and this competition, 10 researchers were invited to the White House in a bipartisan manner to announce this for 
and, and their commitment to um, precision medicine in the coming years. What our group has committed with support of substantial support of the University of Arizona was to conduct case-based reasoning, perhaps more um, specific to the presentation of today, doing patient-centric analyses and interpreting the dynamic disease-associated gene expression uh, from N of 1 uh, studies, and also uh, developing pharmacogenomic, which is the second part of the presentation that I won't have time to address today. So um, what we've applied is really scalar theory, as hypothesized by uh, um, Dr. Blois in the uh, 1970s at Stanford. And here is an example with hemophilia, where at the molecular cause, at the level, lower level, as you can see here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, the molecular cause can be inherited or acquired. And then there's um, some clinical phenotype of prolonged bleeding time and an intermediate phenotype that could be imputed. And I'll show you how we can impute that. So clinically, uh, it's one of the oldest uh, genetic disease that's understood. Uh, you can have um, a, a mutation, a missense mutation on the intrinsic or the extrinsic pathway. And as soon as one of these um, protein is inefficient, you have a prolonged bleeding time downstream. If there's, um, if there, and these are, um, um, these are acquired uh, in a recessive way, so you need the two, um, the two alleles to have the recessive, recessive uh, trait. Or, but if it's acquired on both pathways, it's actually embryologically lethal, so we don't know individuals that have the um, hemoph hemophilia from both pathways. Um, there's also ways to acquire it. And instead of having a gene defect now, having a protein that's ineffective, a simple reduction of the expression of multiple proteins, multiple gene products on both pathways has the same summative effect of prolonged bleeding time. Obviously the cause here, for example, an alcoholic with multiple pancreatitis and, and hepatitis will um, not necessarily have the same flamboyant phenotype as a hemophilia or they'll have different phenotypes, but they'll have that in common. They'll have this, this um, prolonged bleeding time and um, that can be imputed either through a genetic test in a Mendelian disease or to the summative effect of multiple gene products in an acquired disease. And we're in the hope that these type of systems biology approach by taking networks at the molecular level, at the functional level, and at the disease level and bring this together can help us in high throughput, make many predictions. And among these, um, you could, for example, take the online Mendelian inheritance in man that has Mendelian diseases, connect it to the systematized nomenclature of medicine through the disease name, connect it to the gene through, for example, the keg pathways or the gene ontology, and compute in high throughput an overrepresentation of membership in a class of disease and in a class of gene. In this case here, I'm showing the coagulation cascade. That's all, the, the genes that are member of the coagulation cascade are also members of the hematological system. So in the high throughput, we know these two are systematically related. It's obvious that the naked eye, but you can actually compute thousands of uh, systems properties of medicine, many of which recapitulate book chapters of subspecialties of medicine. And addition, in addition, you get hundreds of new hypotheses that had eluded both biologists and clinicians that can be tested. Now, in a single transcriptome analysis, with, there are different approaches that exist. There's um, approaches in having multiple measurements over time that's used at Stanford by um, um, Schneider's group. And they can use time series, and that's end of one uh, end of end of one strategies that have been uh, published recently. Um, there's also using a single transcriptome as a, a reference, which I've indicated that um, a, a reference standard and a single transcriptome. These are not um, really providing the right results, and uh, our group has um, pioneered many mathematical approaches to compare two transcriptomes together, and I'll show you a few. Um, again, the principle is to go from a cohort-based study to a single subject study, 
And then once we have a single subject study, we can use meta-analyses to compare subjects across studies with increased power. Fundamentally, we've moved the problem from heterogeneic conditions, where we need 30 people per group to see differences of transcriptomes and hundreds to make classifiers, into an isogenic condition similar to an animal model or a cellular model. The techniques I'll be showing you have been shown in cellular models to recapitulate with MR2 samples what could be obtained by t-test, for example, with three samples per group. These are isogenic conditions where the t-test requires far less subjects per group to make, um, to make conclusions. But again, we're still reducing the increasing the power we have with a smaller sample set. Um, one technique could be to, instead of looking at the entire transcriptome at a time, just pathway by pathway, look in two samples whether the same gene product, whether it's proteome or transcriptome, if you put them in a, in a two-dimensional graph where each dot is the gene expression position across the two samples, whether there's a change from the 45, from the 45 degree curve. The Mahalanobis distance developed in the 1900s provide that insight. And that she shows you a deviation from, um, from having uh, the expression being similar between the two samples. Another approach could be mixture models, statistical models, where we try to discover distribution of upregulated, downregulated, and un unaltered genes in the entire uh, genome, and then do an overrepresentation of these genes in different pathways to recognize which pathway is significant. And um, one approach that we've looked into is whether um, pathway level um, signal could arise faster than single biomarker signal. And if you consider three patients here, subject one, two, and three, and you do a single subject study in each one of them with the statistics I've shown you, you can identify distinct genes that are up or down regulated in red and blue uh, respectively. And you can see that it's not the same gene products that are up and down regulated across patients. But you can make some assumptions. For example, 20% of the genes are responsive here and half of them are up regulated. We can thus simulate these conditions over and over again and recognize when it's actually the signals at the pathway, how many times could we find a single biomarker and in which conditions, and then flip the paradigm over and think, well, what if it were a pathway level, how many more conditions, how many more marker could we find as a biomarker? So a t-test usually looks across patients, as shown to the right, multiple measurement of one gene. What we're proposing is within patient to show um, um, aggregate the signal within patient across multiple genes, and then compare the signal through meta-analyses across patients. This becomes now isogenic studies in each patient. These are the results. If you have 100% of genes upregulated in the pathway, or even 25%, and that 25% um, at minimum are responsive, you can actually find a signal at the biomarker level, which is in red, conventional t-test, and in black, uh, using a pathway level biomarker, and in this condition E as well. However, the t-test will not be able to recognize uh, easily oops, a biomarker in um, a single, um, um, if the pathway, if, if the genes are, could be up or down regulated, so 50% of the time they're up, 50% down, because the signal will be cut consistent between patients. Um, on the other hand, at lower um, level of response, five or 10%, and lower, and in all conditions, the, um, the um, pathway level in black, biomarker can be discovered, but the, the um, as you can see in red, the, uh, the discovery of a single biomarker doesn't work. These are precision recall curve, precision being the y-axis and recall the x-axis, and the perfect re precision recall is shown to the lower right as being a horizontal bar to the top that 
falls at the end to the right. Um, this is an application of the N of 1 in different patients. Each circular graph represents a patient, and we're showing among 40 patients that had lung uh, cancer, which ones survive more than five years and those less than five year, uh, less than a year. Um, and you can see the patterns that are discovered. Each radial aspect is one pathway. The unchanged expression is at the medial level between the gray and the white area. 10,000 times over expression is at the total, um, um, the total circle is, is in globe. And abrogation of the signal, you can see the gray zone. So you can see that the five patients, uh, the four patients at the bottom, all have overexpression of a DNA and chromatin assembly as shown to the left in the wheel. These are different goal terms, which are gene sets of these pathways. And chromosomal location as well is upregulated 10,000 times. And there's abrogation of hormonal secretion and homeostasis in these patients. They're consistently like that. And if you look at those that survive five, ways, five, year, uh, five years, they're almost homeostatic in terms of these pathways. And again, we can interpret the pathway in each patient because here we've compared the, cancers, the cancer with unaffected tissue in each of these patients. Each of these have a p-value and uh, an effect size, which is the, size of the, the inference of the pathway, uh, just like you would have in a cohort study. This is um, another experiment where we, um, we've looked into predicting patients that would um, be hospitalized for asthma among pediatric patients that were all severe. They were in a clinical trial. They were all max treated with the maximum treatment. And we knew that about 50% of, uh, of them would be hospitalized for severe asthma during the coming year. But we didn't know which ones. The clinicians couldn't predict either. The, um, uh, provocation, the bronchial provocation test, which is the organ level um, provocation test, was similar between the patients. We had a cohort in which we could train. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough uh, patients to train the classifier among the pediatric patients. We took uh, patients at Duke that suffered from no diseases but were exposed to rhinovirus. The rhinovirus was the uh, is known as causal for many of these hospitalization in pediatric patients. It was first known as associated, but not considered causal. And therefore, we thought that was the right responsive assay to try for our pediatric patients. The healthy subjects were subjected in vivo. They inhaled the, um, the virus, and half of them had symptoms. It's the rhinovirus is a common cold, so they had a headache and um, runny nose. And half did not, yet they were shedding the virus. Um, and, and thus, we could learn a classifier on 20 subjects using um, the results from each of these N of 1 studies. Usually at the transcriptome level, it takes 100 to 300 subjects to learn a classifier. There are many reasons for which this works in the, in, when we compare to the patient to themselves, but really fundamentally is because we turn the problem into isogenic conditions, just like a cellular or an animal model for each phase patient, we get much more power per patient, we get far less features to consider across patients, and all of that together simplifies the problem and gives us two orders of magnitude improvement for classifier. For the subjects, so the classifier was learned from the new patients on the top. For the subjects that were um, pediatric patients, of course, we did not expose them to the virus. We did an ex vivo assay. We exposed for 24 hours um, uh, the uh, the blood to the virus, and we had a controlled blood against which we compared the transcriptomes. These are the results. You can see contingency table. This is a clinical phenotype on the top, and to the left, you have what we call a virogram assay and a classifier prediction, and you can see uh, a pretty good prediction of the patient. Here, we color-coded the uh, different pathways that were involved, and you can see acquired immunity as being very active in the exacerbated patients clinically and those that were predicted, as well as the chromatin organization, while the morphogenesis and the response to stimulus were those that were more predictive of the uh, non-exacerbated. Showing that we didn't cheat, in all cases, the asthmatic patients were all have a very high expression of the innate immune, immune response, 
which arguably was uh, capable of distinguishing uh, healthy subjects that had the symptoms or not of, of cold, but uh, that component of the, the classifier was not uh, useful in our case. But again, we didn't cheat. We used a fully specified classifier. We didn't touch it. It predicted adequately our patients with, for the first time in literature, a genome by environment classifier rather than a transcriptome classifier. Well, I, I want to thank uh, our collaborators, Fernando Martinez that helped us in asthma, um, the asthma studies, and um, particularly Vincent Gardeur and Hai Chuan Li, Iqbal Ashore, Jen Wang Li, and Joanne Burgott and Colleen Kinos that uh, contributed for these studies. These are the um, areas where we receive funding. And thank you for your attention. And um, take home messages. Well, um, we have received funding in asthma to go to the next step now and recruit a larger cohort study and get a commercial classifier uh, functional. We would need more patients. The current classifier is only 75% predictive and we need to, for clinical purposes, we need a far better one. It should not be learned in healthy subjects subjected to cold, but should be learned in asthmatic subjects. So we're in the process of, we are two, year in, in two years into the process of that five-year grant. We have patent application that protects intellectual property so that investment from the industry could also support uh, this type of effort. We also saw patent application in predicting drug repositioning from non-coding non genome. And uh, we have additional evidence there uh, that it works. We have genetic evidence um, in the three GWAS studies that we can discover antagony. Uh, antagony means that uh, Two risk factors when they're inherited together gives you um, gives you actually um, prevention of the disease so it's paradoxical and we found that in Alzheimer's we found that in bladder cancer and in arthritis arthritis these results are published and we are now looking into antagony between diseases and we're trying to find also a synergy between diseases for which we have um, evidence with uh, clinical studies that we can discover in high throughput a number of comorbidities that are well known, and many more, hundreds more, that eluded clinicians in the past. In other words, we have a predictive system for um, uh, comorbid conditions with a genetic underpinning that predicted it. Um, the odds ratio there are tenfold, so it's pretty substantial. And we have also odds ratio when we are predicting drug, that, that drug that we have predict that we have reposition from non-coding regions with that we are discovering an excess of known mechanism and known drug that we're um, predicting the, um, that were known in drug bank to uh, treat patients and we have additional predictions. There the odds ratio is around 20. So we're um, encouraged by the fact that the non-coding regions converge mechanistically with many known mechanism of diseases and then inform us on additional mechanisms that were yet unknown and not so trivial because there's no gene, the coding coding gene in the vicinity of these SNPs. So these are the ways by which we are trying to um, bring these to market. Finally, the genome by environment interaction study that I've shown, such as the one for asthma, eventually we can drill down to probably the most um, 15 or 20 gene product of interest. And with the Mahal Nobis distance statistics I've shown you in the beginning, you don't need the remainder of the transcriptome. In other words, with an, a little essay that could be done overnight, measures of qPCR in, for a 15 gene products in two conditions, you would have enough to uh, make a prediction, a clinical prediction. This reduces substantially the cost of uh, precision medicine and enables um, workers all around the world, even in third world countries, in secondary care hospital that have knowledge of how to do qPCR, they don't need to be retrained to conduct these studies and uh, have the results overnight. Thank you for your time, Beth. and I'll end on this. So, Marshall, uh, do we have any questions at this point? We have one question. I apologize in advance for any mispronunciation of people's names. This question comes from Mayan Obeydat, and the question is, how can antagony be measured in GWAS data? 
Uh, so um, that's interesting. Um, you can go to our NPG genomic medicine paper, which is um, uh, from 2017 and it's or 2016, and it's uh, cited in the presentation a bit further. Um, there are different ways you can use uh, uh, regressions, and you can all, you also use um, information theoretic uh, metrics. We use both uh, in, in our studies. So there, um, there's information theoretic metrics that can show that the um, uh, information flow increases when you consider an interaction term or not. Um, so in GWAS studies, conceptually, it's pretty simple. You look at your individuals that have interested the two SNPs, the two single nucleotide polymorphism that were predicted to interact, and you compare them to three other conditions, those that have one or the other SNP, uh, one alone or the other one alone, and none of these two. And um, you can then calculate the uh, odds ratio in different conditions. You need to be powered sufficiently for the patients that have uh, two uh, that inherit the two SNPs, so the size of the GWAS needs to be um, in consideration of that, and it depends on the uh, frequency of these uh, of these risk factors. But for the Alzheimer's, for example, um, which is shown there, each SNP increased doubled the risk of Alzheimer's, and together they reduced by half the risk of Alzheimer's. In rheumatoid arthritis, it was a bit more uh, significant than that, and that really flies in the face of the original model of 23andMe. Uh, where they would send patients or subjects, individuals, their risk factors side by side. And I, I guess, you know, once you see one risk of Alzheimer's and another risk of Alzheimer's, it's obvious that someone's thinking it's probably additive and will try to add, that, add these together. And it's actually totally wrong unless you investigate also the interactions. And we know because of the inheritability gap that the GWAS have been unsuccessful in identifying a majority of the risk in common diseases. For example, diabetes that's been, been, that has been the best studied, diabetes type 2, is 80% inheritable, according to the estimates of geneticists. Perhaps they're exaggerated. There are other reasons for that. But through the GWAS, the highest SNP has less than 2% increase of odds ratio of having the disease. There's about um, 25 that are known, and they add together for less than 16% of the risk. So even if you were to inherit all these, you'd be really unlucky, it doesn't explain the inheritance. The inheritance probably lies in interaction. People have thought for diabetes, perhaps it's also in rare variants. Well, that has been tested, and for diabetes, that's not the case. It may well be the case in other diseases, though. So it may be that there are many other causes responsible for the inheritability. But looking to the interaction and the synergy of risk um, is, is obviously essential. Great, thank you. Marshall, any additional questions or comments? I have a second question. This one comes from Lubna Akabir. And the question is, do data from N of 1 transcriptome provide insights which are applicable for the general population, or are they only meant to be used in personalized medicine? Oh, uh, definitely to provide insight for the general population. This is a good question. Um, we've shown in some studies, for example, that um, so there's something um, unique about these studies. In single subject studies, you identify what an effect size and a p-value in differentially expressed pathways. And now we have a paper that's under review for differentially expressed transcripts. Um, but from that, you can learn there, there are parts of that that are probably common to a large number of people that have the same condition. And there are probably some that are very individual and rarely in common with other people and something that's are more rare. So we're showing in different studies, like the first one we've published, that um, among 60 patients with cancer, what we can re rediscover in the majority of people with just one end of one study, we can re rediscover about 60% of what's known as, as disregulated in path of pathways in large studies that have hundreds of patients. So just from one person, we already know 60% of what a large study has. And then the aggregate effect of 
a dozen people, you can pretty much know about 90% of what you would known you would know from a very large study. So it opens the opportunity to learn about the commonality in rare diseases and in frequent diseases where our, our strat microstratified phenotype of otherwise large, more common diseases. So that's one aspect. It also informs us of what's unique about the person and what's rare. And we've seen that uh, among that cohort of 50 uh, or 40 to 50 lung cancers, we would dis the majority the, the, if we if we sum all the different pathways we've discovered, 60% to 70% of the pathways were not known in more than three people among the 50. Were never discovered in the large cohort studies, most of which were also immune conditions. So this, like half of that was about the immunity, which informs us, as we well know in cancer, that. Um, we haven't even touched enough of the uh, immune potential we have to resolve this condition. And there's a lot more dysregulation and it's much more specific to each person what's going on. So it helps us triangulate cocktails of treatments that would be better to, to, for one subject. And it forms us in smaller samples rapidly on what happens in the population as well. So it has those two potentials. I hope this answers the question. Great, thank you. Marshall, are there any other questions? Yes, I have two more questions. One is from uh, Chris Carlston. Okay, I'll try that. Thanks, uh, Marshall, and thanks, uh, Eve. Um, yeah, probably better verbally, because kind of a, a somewhat long question, but I'm really interested in the end of one concept um, as it applies to environmental exposures, which is my focus and my research. Um, and I, I understand conceptually with cancer when you have one individual with a, a tumor and a, a non-tumor tissue in that same individual, I can, I can understand how to apply an N of one in that situation. But for an individual that's exposed to something like the virus example that you used, um, I can understand how that's a starting point where you and I didn't total I didn't totally get the methodology and you can maybe reiterate, but I, I can imagine how in a given individual before a virus and after one can look at his or her transcriptome and uh, essentially map out the change. But if you're looking at N of one, how can you confidently say that that one episode of a virus has anything to do really with the virus as opposed to some other random coincidental events? Um, and, and even if it were do that do that virus on that one occasion, the next time a virus comes along, it's going to be inevitably different in terms of the virus or the, the circumstances of, of the day, you know, all those variables. So I, I guess what I'm asking in a nutshell for the, for the exposures, at this point I can get it conceptually, but it seems uh, very far from practical as opposed to cancer where it, me it makes a lot more clinical sense to me at this point. Okay, well, I'll take over. So um, actually, um, a third of the complex diseases are immune mediated. So having access to um, a tissue of relevance like the blood is interesting for up to a third of them. So that's in part, you need a tissue of relevance to the clinical condition you're looking into, and you need the assay of relevance. So for cancer, it's clear. Infectious disease, it's clear. So we are funded right now to study coccidiodiomycosis in a disseminated form. A third of the people living in Southern California, Southern Arizona, New Mexico, and Northern Mexico have been exposed to that, um, to that uh, germ and are asymptomatic. Very few, 3% will experience a temporary disease, which will be a skin condition or a lung condition. The lung is, can last up to a year. And then one out of 500 will have a lifelong condition, assuming they're treated in a timely manner, because otherwise they'll die. And that's called the disseminated coccidiomycosis. So we're funded to understand those mechanisms. There, there's a genetic form, and that's very rare. We know only five families in the world. And fortunately, they're in that network and they're providing samples. And we know of uh, the common form in which no other family members are involved. It, it occurs in one person, so it's a common inheritance. It's more complex. 
uh, and we're deconvoluting that signal and we're using coccidiomycosis lysates that are dead as the trigger. We know it's the condition and we can test in people that have had the disease and people that are naive to the disease and um, people that have had the disease with mild consequences, temporary consequences, those that have a lifelong condition. And that helps us uh, deconvolute the signal that's genetic and too complex otherwise to understand. We have convergence in the same pathway of the change of transcriptomes from all the Mendelian forms. So that's really interested, even though it's different gene defects, it's uh, usually not a missense mutation, but it's, it's affecting the immune system and they're usually, uh, it's usually missense, not nonsense mutation. So it's modulating pathways in ways that are deleterious. Concerning the virus like asthma, so there was a body of evidence for pediatric asthma first associating rhinovirus to the hospitalization, eventually showing that it was the trigger for the hospitalization. And thus we knew it was a driver of the condition. We would do that ex vivo on the blood of the patient, and thus done overnight in incubation, you put the virus in one vial and you put uh, a solute, the uh, equivalent quantity of solutes with no virus in the other one, you have control conditions. Um, we don't think it's so complicated actually, uh, to conduct. The coccidiomycosis is done with a lysis, so it doesn't require more than a, a biological safety level two. For the rhinovirus, I believe also it's two, level two. All pathology labs are um, in hospitals are satisfied that requirement. And um, um, then you can compare the uh, conditions the following day. Um, so the question okay. is to how, how is it predictive um, I think that goes more into the fact that we're looking to a large number of features and it's not always the same features that work in each individual. Even though you see commonality, you, you can see differences also in the subsets of features. That's how these classifiers work. Can I just clarify, I don't know, am I still on? Yes. Okay, so I, I, what I get from that um, nice um, explanation is that the buildup to the in vitro or ex vivo test is not an N of one. It's a it's a it's it's data from a, a whole number of people. Then you build towards an N of one in a a blood based test with a lysate, et cetera. So so that's sort of making more sense how it becomes an N of one. But the the test that's done uh, ex vivo um, conceptually or in reality that you've done, whether it's with Coxi or one of the viruses. What is that um, out of body? And, and I'm a supporter of this. So I'm, I'm just asking. I, I want to let you know I, I like your well, talk. Well, it's thorny. Yes. So, so what so, does that tell you about what is what is that test that's done? How, what has it been shown to actually tell you about that patient clinically um, that 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 changes the course of their disease or the therapy or whatever? Okay. So there are two questions here. The first one you mentioned. Um, we've learned through other studies first. Well, you need to have the right assay and you need to have the, the right specimen. So that's informed from the literature, but there were no transcriptome analyses that preceded the N of one to make the classifier. The classifier was designed entirely de novo from transcriptomes. So it was not informed from previous studies. I want to make that clear. So it's very powerful. It can really, in small groups, generate classifiers and well, we have simulations and we have one case. So I guess you can still say it's anecdotal, but uh, we're pretty advanced into that as compared to uh, conventional classifiers that take 300 patients. So that, I wanted to make that point clear that we don't need to have, uh, as long as we have the right assay and we have the right, uh, the right tissue, um, the learning of the features is all self-inclusive within the N of one strategy, followed by machine learning methods that are exactly the same as you would do for large transcriptomes. The second part, which is um, really, how does it inform us specifically about one person? That's, that's thorny. Uh, you, you very well know that um, um, the, we're, we're using, um, um, PBMC, the peripheral blood mononuclear site, and the survival of the white blood cells are not the same according to the cell type. 
even over 12 hours, there's a difference. Uh, there are differences uh, that we see um, where when the RNA is extracted on different days. So, so you really have to have the two specimens that are paired done by the same person the same day for extracting the RNA. We see differences um, if the fresh frozen samples are, are sent to us versus um, they're, uh, they're fresh. Uh, and we have the assays in which we've compared all of these. Nonetheless, we can find a signal uh, regardless. Now, are they as informative as a prosthetic specific antigen? No, we're not at that level yet. Um, we're triangulating at the transcript level at the specific gene is fundamentally what we're not looking at. We're looking at different transcripts for which a summative effect in distinct people would affect the same pathway. So the interpretation is not as simple as it was in the past in, uh, I would say, highly reductionist strategy that we've used for Mendelian diseases. And it's work in progress, but uh, we're funded in number three studies right now to uh, apply these techniques and triangulate and get to a nearer result that, uh, that, that it's generally, it, it, we believe we'll be able to have executable knowledge but if you want to triangulate it at the single person, at the single molecule that's responsible, I think that's kind of the wrong paradigm. It will be the single pathway that's re or a few pathways that interact that are responsible, but it won't reduce down to the level of satisfaction you have with a Mendelian disease. That's great. Thank you so much for your, for your uh, thoughtful explanation. Thank you. You're welcome. Marshall? Yes, we have uh, two more questions. Both come from Mayan Obeydat, who asked the earlier question about antagony being measured in GWAS data. Follows, uh, this is how it reads. Thanks. So is antagony a form of epistasis? Can you detect it with summary data or individual level data? Uh, it, it has to be individual level data. You cannot do it by the summary. So you'd have to download the dbGaP data if you do it retrospectively. In the paper we did, and again, I didn't present any of these results, I just gave you the conclusion at the end. Um, the, in the paper we did, we asked colleagues that are geneticists, statistical geneticists, one from Vanderbilt and one from um, uh, University of Pennsylvania, to use unpublished data and unpublished studies to validate our results. And we gave them each three combinations of SNPs per disease. So the Jason Moore from UFN had two diseases. So he had three SNPs per three pairs of SNPs per disease. And Josh Denny had uh, three pairs of disease for rheumatoid arthritis. So, uh, and among these, they found that two thirds of these had either synergy or antagony. So one of these, one didn't pan out and the other two did pan out. So we didn't go in fishing expedition. We were very precise and we had very high yield among our predictions. So all three genetic studies are published in the same paper. Great, and the uh, second question from the, the same person reads, what are your thoughts on cell heterogeneity in transcriptome data, especially in blood? Cool, so um, I'm not sure it's cited in the presentation. I think I deleted the slide. Uh, but you can look into a paper authored by Schiffler, S-C-H-I-L-L-E-R, Lucie, myself, and Pigorsch, P-I-E-G-O-R-S-H. And um, that's a paper in which we used, uh, we used very few data that there is. It was on, uh, pan uh, on prostate cancer, single cell transcriptomes on prostate cancer, and the response to therapy. And we develop a new metric on how to use N of one statistic to compare one cell to a group of cells. Now, the statistics I've shown you can be used in paired conditions in, for isogenic studies, but the Mahalanobis distance, for example, does not have the requirement of the data being paired in the same, nor the clustering, nor the mixture enrichment. So technically, you could compare one sample to other samples, and well, one at a time, and you can get different measures. So we've developed new statistics that built on top of that, 
to do single cell studies, uh, single cell transcriptome analyses, and we could show how we could predict the pathways involved in, um, in uh, res resistance to therapy. And we could also, and those, and we recapitulated five pathways that were published, and we didn't validate that one because we didn't have an additional cohort, but there was a sixth one. We didn't predict anything else but these five and a sixth one. There's one that was, that eluded previous methods of uh, analysis over this data set that we identified, and it remains to be seen if it's correct or not. Um, the difference that we had with the other publications is that the, the original publication had to aggregate a large number of single cell transcriptome per patient to make predictions and a large number of patients. And we've shown we could reduce that and make predictions by one patient against a group instead of, and, and one cell in one patient rather than six or seven cells in one patient. So um, it's applicable to these conditions as well. It's just, you know, it's, it's like legal blocks. Now you have to assemble them a bit differently and, and add new statistics into it. All right. So Dr. Lucier, before we uh, bid you adieu, we, how far away are we from uh, a totally new way of treating patients uh, at the primary care level or at the specialist level with this new approach? Well, uh, I would say for asthma, we're at least three years away. We'll have to complete the current study and hopefully obtain a classifier that's got um, clinical application. With other, um, with other precision medicine tools that are not Mendelian reductionism, but that are more about systems, we may be um, nearer. I mean, uh, technically, uh, um, there are a few classifier level tests that are used in, in, in uh, clinics regularly. You have uh, Mamaprint and uh, uh, Oncotype DX that are used in breast cancer to determine whether um, subjects are, uh, would benefit from a very high cost uh, therapy or not. So that's reimbursed in US because uh, for the five, four or $5,000 test for the, te for, for the, the classifier, uh, there's you know a hundred thousand dollar treatment that may or may not be useful. So uh, deciding, making that decision is uh, economically cost effective. Um, I, I I'd like to remind everyone though that both of these tests were not developed from transcriptome wide analyses. They were developed by a biased subset of features. In one case. They reviewed the literature and they decided to do the classifier among 250 um, onco on oncogenes. So they had different studies and animal and cellular models that determined these oncogenes were involved in breast cancer. And the study was done using them as features and 75 re retained, the other ones removed, and the classifier is based on these 75. And the other one was done in an animal model to reduce the dimension. They decided that wound healing and breast cancer would be relevant. Uh, and the differentially expressed genes from wound healing, again, about 750, and they chose a subset of a few hundred among these that could, through classifiers, uh, identify a predictive classifier in two or 300 uh, breast cancer patients and validated it in an independent set. So these, um, um, these methods of feature redu reduction were biological. If you think about it, there were, there were, in both cases, a lot of biology was done to, before choosing among features. And um, to date, there's not a single classifier that was done totally and unbiasedly from the entire transcriptome that's commercially available. So um, we're in the hope that these new methods we're proposing reduce enough the features so that we could make these uh, these classifiers in absence of as much biology. You understand that breast cancer, where these two predictors exist, um, is one of the cancer that has received the most research and funding, and there's a substantial number of patients, so there's an economy there um, that can drive these uh, these business models. It's harder in other disciplines. So we're involved also in microRNAs predicting 
oligometastatic progression with uh, Dr. Ralph Waxenbaum from the University of Chicago. And we may be, again, about five or eight years away from a classifier. The, the hardest part is to accrue the cohort, and uh, it's rate limiting. Mm. Well, thank you very much for your response to that question. It's 3 o'clock, and so I'm going to thank each of our attendees for their thoughtful engagement with today's speaker. We hope that the content of this presentation was useful to everyone in attendance. And please let us know how you um, felt about this webinar. Immediately after we close the session, you'll be prompted to complete a brief survey and provide us with your feedback. It'll only take a minute, but your response will help us plan future allergen webinars. So thank you again for taking part in the webinar, and again, very special thanks on everyone's behalf to our presenter today, Dr. Eve Lucier from the University of Arizona, uh, for his most exciting presentation. So I uh, hope to see you all again in the fall, and thank you very much for attending, and we will be back in touch when we have our next webinar scheduled. Take care and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.